Welcome in, everybody, to the flagship podcast recap. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined uh, by Horns247 Managing Editor Taylor Estes. We are in San Antonio. It is already Friday morning after a 27-20 Alamo Bowl loss uh, by the Longhorns against number 12, Washington. Um, And Taylor, Washington was everything uh, they were cracked up to be. Uh, Michael Penix Jr., got to give some credit uh, to uh, the Huskies because they were clearly uh, disrespected. They felt disrespected as three-and-a-half-point underdogs, uh, as the um, 10-win team on a six-game winning streak, now seven-game winning streak, including the come-from-behind win at Oregon. Um, Well, the win over... Oregon State and Oregon, both in the month of November. And Texas tonight, uh, just, well, we'll get into it, but I didn't quite follow the game plan by Steve Sarkeesian uh, to get away from the run, go to a a pass-heavy game plan. And look, it was a seven-point game at the end, but it was was the Longhorns playing a lot of catch-up there at the end. Um, and they didn't have a running game at all, uh, didn't really try to establish it. I think at halftime they had 10 carries for 18 yards. I get that Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson were not in this game. They were on the sideline in sweats. Uh, but Taylor, I mean, Jonathan Brooks came into this game averaging seven and a half a carry. Uh, everything I'd heard out of bowl practices is, is that the guy was chomping at the opportunity that he, he, he had elevated his intensity, everything in practice um, because he knew he was going to get a shot. And then Keelan Robinson gets the start at running back, which is fine. He's the junior. He's been with Sark since they were at Alabama together. Um, but Keelan Robinson is not a between the tackles guy. He dances a lot. And, and, and that, you know, that's not going to get it done. Jonathan Brooks gets North and South. Jonathan Brooks had two touchdowns tonight on those very, very limited uh, touches. He had a a nice 34-yard catch-and-run touchdown. He had a gritty uh, three-yard touchdown run in the fourth quarter uh, to help Texas kind of close the margin of of defeat here. But um, the Texas defense didn't play that well, especially as the game wore on. They had an interception. I thought this was uh, symbolic of the whole night, Taylor. Uh, Texas, Jaron Thompson gets an interception in the first quarter. The offense goes three and out and suffers their first blocked punt of the season. Uh, So they get nothing out of that uh, turnover by the the Texas defense. And then as the game wore on, uh, the Texas defense struggled on third and fourth down to get off the field. Washington had long, grueling drives to to points. Right. Uh, just a tough night uh, to finish the season on after uh, some some really promising uh, stuff, especially from the Texas defense. Um, you know, and and the running game down the second half of the season for the Longhorns. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it, you're right. You know, kind of things fell apart and was you know, kind of a um, symbolic of how some of the losses have gone for Texas this year, where it's like, you know, the defense starts off, gets an interception, and then the offense, well, I think they went three and out, I, I think. was Did they go three and out? Yeah. And three then and get a blocked punt. And yeah, and you know, and the other thing too is the long, grueling drives are the things that have led to some of the poor defensive performances throughout this season, even last season too. I mean, the, the time of possession differential, you know, Washington had the ball for 35 minutes compared 35, 46 compared to Texas, 24, 14. And yeah, I mean, Steve Sarkeesian said that the plan going into the game was to rely more on the passing game. Um, And I will say this, you know, when you, I know that people look at the passing game and not really connecting on some, but like there were some balls that were like right perfect place balls and Xavier Worthy dropped back to back ones that could have been a touchdown. I mean, honestly, you know, those were deep shots that probably would have been for six. And so 
Yeah, it just it was really weird. I was I was expecting Jonathan Brooks to be more involved too because I don't think that Keelan Robinson's really been kind of the go to like starter. He's kind of the the Swiss Army knife, I would say, more so than the lead running back type of um, you know, just the talent or not the talent, but just like what his skill set is is not really as you said to be that kind of between the tackles type of running back. So I was expecting a lot more of Jonathan Brooks. That didn't happen really, but it just, um, you know, it's definitely a disappointing end of the season. But it's also, you know, when you have your two best players on offense, especially that have, in, especially as the season wore on, been the guys that you rely on, especially late in games to run out the clock and stuff. When you don't have them available, it's hard to really expect a the running game to just click right where they left off. You know what I mean? And so I could kind of understand why Sark was expecting to pass the ball more. But I definitely was, a, it was a little bit of a head scratcher on as to why Jonathan Brooks didn't get more carries than he did. Yeah, I, 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 I get starting the junior Keelan Robinson uh, in the game, reward him for uh, being a, a warrior and a guy, like you said, who does a little bit of everything. He's, he's a special teams uh, star. He, he can catch the football. He caught, what, three passes for 30 yards tonight. He had more yards through the air than he did on the ground. He had eight carries for 27 yards, three catches for 30. Um, you know, Jonathan Brooks gets eight, uh, eight or nine touches, six carries, um, and scores two touchdowns. I would love to have seen the game plan built around Jonathan Brooks, who came into the game averaging seven and a half yards per carry. He's made plays every time he's been in a game. He made plays tonight, right. uh, but he didn't get a chance to really get going um, in this game. In fact, there was one drive in the first half where they ran it three times and they ran it all with Keel and Robinson. Uh, and it was the one time I felt like Steve Sarkeesian was really committing to the run and they didn't pull it off so they end up punting uh and we know from past experience that Steve Sarkeesian can uh get dissuaded out of running the football when he runs into um you know some uh turbulence yeah, like traffic. like he did on that drive i i, I got to give some credit um to Quinn Ewers because the first half there were two critical um, there was a fourth and one at the Washington 37 and he had Xavier worthy wide open on a glance and he threw it four yards behind him. It was like, Whoa. And you went back and watched the replay. You're like, there was no pressure. Mm-hmm. Ewers just rushed it. He didn't set his feet and, and he missed badly. Uh, and that was obviously a huge play. Um, because Washington converted both of their fourth downs, and this was in Washington territory. Uh, Texas had driven into Washington territory. Obviously, anytime you go for it on fourth and one, it's significant. And to miss Worthy that badly, and then ironically, as you pointed out, uh, Ewers kind of gets it going in the second half with the passing game, and he throws two perfect Deep balls from the Texas 39 on second and third down. Two different routes. One a go ball, the other a post. And both of them landed at the Washington 20 in Xavier Worthy's hands. And the ball goes right through his hands. And that's just, are you kidding me type stuff. Uh, For all the times that, I mean, uh, Worthy was targeted 14 times in this game. He caught seven, uh, led the team with uh, 84 yards receiving. But once again, he was the focus of the of the passing game. And for Worthy to drop those two balls when Texas was uh, only 10 points behind at that point, um, that was significant. He also dropped a pass that would have gone for a first down earlier than that. And so he had three Big time drops, and um, yeah, that you know, um, fair meth fair catch punt too. That, what's that? The fair catch that he had on the punt that he dropped and it or bobbled and it went out of bounds. Too. Yeah, I mean it. It uh, 
I don't know what was going on there, but um, it, it we've seen this before. We saw it against TCU where, um, you know, when Ewers had it going, receivers were dropping balls. Um, the running game never got going against TCU. And and I, that that's what disappointed me the most because I just didn't like the me- message that it sent uh, to Jonathan Brooks and to the offensive line. Uh, it, it basically said, okay, well, Bijan and Roshan aren't here. We cannot run the football. Right. So we're going to throw it. Mm-hmm. And that's a dangerous recipe, uh, especially with a quarterback who's, you know, been up and down. Now he, Quinn Ewers finished with a nice completion percentage, 66% completion. But as I mentioned, he missed worthy on the fourth and one, and then he missed, uh, Jordan Whittington or Whittington couldn't come up with the catch on a third and three at midfield in the first half in the second quarter. Uh, those were two critical, um, you know, incompletions that, could have helped the offense get going, maybe extend a drive to points. The defense played its butt off, I thought, in the first half. They were down 13 to three um, because the offense just couldn't, you know, seem to to get anything going. We've seen this before. And then in the second half, the offense gets that 34 yard catch and run touchdown from Jonathan Brooks. So suddenly it's a 13 10 game. Everything's fine. And then Washington answers that touchdown by going for it on fourth and one from their own 34. And it looked like they were trying to draw Texas off sides. They twice, they motioned players. They used hard counts. You thought they were just going to, you know, take a delay a game or something. Then all of a sudden they snap it and Michael Penix runs, you know, he pushes forward for two yards, gets the first down Taylor that extends that turns out to extend a 14 play drive that took six minutes off the clock and ended in a touchdown. It was the turning point in the, in the game in terms of, you know, just the offense finally give you, gives you a little bit of life. The defense needs to get off the field on that fourth and one. They don't. And Washington ends up going down the field, eating almost seven minutes off the clock, getting the touchdown. Uh, and that's when you knew it was going to be tough. And that was, <laughs> that was even before the worthy drops on back-to-back right. passes. So, uh, it was, it was Washington's night. It was not Texas's night. And, um, it's, you know, it's frustrating. I just didn't like the message that was sent to the running game in the, you know, tonight, because what is, is Jonathan Brooks chop liver? I mean, is it all about said Baxter coming in next month? Is it? Do we have to wait for said Baxter to get here for Steve Sarkeesian to believe in his offensive line and his running game again? I mean, I didn't like that. And um, I felt like Texas could run the ball. I just needed they needed to try. Right. Yeah, because I think what was I think they finished with 18. Well, technically 14 carries. Um, if you consider the running backs only uh, Quinn Ewers had four as well. But yeah, I mean, that that's definitely not a good sign, I guess. I I don't know. I mean, and I think it it is really hard because like, even though they did have, you know, a lot of practices for this game, maybe Sark, I don't know if it's something that he doesn't trust Jonathan Brooks or Jaden Blue really, or anything like that. I think he probably, um, you know, was a little bit quick to bail on any type of run game when um, he didn't have Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson. And, and like, I mean, I, I think what you said about Quinn Ewers, I think it's important because there have been times this season in the games where he struggled when he had poor throws, it continued. It was not just, Oh, just like a bad pass, like one or two here. It was like one or two turned into like 10 where in this situation, you know, he, he really started rolling on offense and, um, and I think the other thing too, Chip, you know, the, the defense, I, I feel like they were getting the pressure on Michael Penix, but they weren't getting home and he was getting rid of the ball a lot quicker. And, and I have to, you have to give him a ton of credit. I mean, he was really impressive. Um, as I said, in the, the flagship podcast earlier in the week, you know, I hadn't watched a lot of Washington. And so I kind of didn't know what to expect from them. I didn't know how much of it, of their record was based off of 
the, you know, the teams that they played because they didn't play too many great teams. They had a pretty uh, bad strength of schedule, but he was everything as advertised and that offensive line was everything as advertised. So you would have liked to see Texas probably hit home a little bit more. Um, You know, they got a lot of pressure, but didn't get him on the ground. And that was something that Steve Sarkeesian said that they really want to focus on in the off season. One of the biggest things that they're going to work on on defense is to get off the field on third down, same with the offense and stay on the field on third down because that was an issue this season too. But the other thing is getting not just pressure, but getting guys on the ground um, and really dirtying up the the pocket for opposing quarterbacks. So, um, you know, it's, it's not the outcome that Texas fans were expecting. Obviously they, it was a close game. It's at a point. And Texas did kind of come back in it, but yeah, I mean, um, there, it just, it seemed like when the momentum started, something was ready to stop it, whether in it happened on both sides of the ball. Yeah. I, I thought, um, you know, the, you, you want to know about how the opt outs affected the game. Well, clearly Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson not playing caused Steve Sarkeesian to completely abandon the run or try to throw the ball to set up the run. But again, um, I'll remind our listeners, Texas was 5-0 and when they ran it at least 40 times in a game this season. And they are now 0-4 when they attempted at least 34 passes in a game this season. Tonight, they attempt 44 passes and uh, 18 rushing attempts 14 of them by running backs. Um, and then the other opt out on defense, DeMarvian Overshown, uh, the 42 yard touchdown run um, by Washington in the first half. Um, God bless him, David Benda, who was playing weak side linebacker in place of DeMarvian Overshown, lost control of his gap. And, um, and, um, Talapapa of Washington just went screaming down the field uh, for that 42-yard touchdown run. That's not, it's just not a play Texas has given up this year. And, um, you know, this is life now. I mean, this, this Alamo Bowl was going to be a glimpse of Texas next year without DeMarvian Overshone um, and without Bijan Robinson and without Roshan Johnson. That, again, just makes me kind of, ooh. Yeah. Uh, is it all on said Baxter <laughs> as the running back coming in? I mean, I just, I, I I, if I'm Jonathan that. Brooks, if I'm Jonathan Brooks, and I get that Quinn Ewers is, he had a perfect rating as a recruit and all that. And we, you know, I've, I've tried to take some of that off of Quinn Ewers because he only played a year and a half of varsity football in high school. Uh, he had the double hernia surgery. Uh, his junior year, he only played half of that season. He played a full sophomore year, and then he, you know, reclassified. Didn't even play his senior year in high school. So, in my mind, Quinn Ewers is a work in progress, and he's now got this off season coming up to really uh, get it going. He needs to get it going um, because here comes Arch Manning and uh, Malik Murphy. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian said tonight after the game he never once thought about putting Malik Murphy into the game, uh, but. You know, Jonathan Brooks, here he is. He's just salivating at the opportunity to show everyone, hey, I can I can play this game too. And he was an afterthought in the first half. He, he you know, came to life, uh, had the two touchdowns in the second half. But still, Taylor, he only had six carries. Six! Yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, if I'm Jonathan Brooks, I'm frustrated. But, um, but. You know, Steve Sarkeesian said he thought the best uh, game plan was to throw it more. And he felt like even, you know, with the result tonight that that he was that he was correct on that. But we'll never know because we didn't really get to see Jonathan Brooks. Yeah, because he did say that that was the plan all along. It was not something like it wasn't working. They just stopped, you know. Um, trying to do it. It was a plan all along to throw the ball, he said. And he did say he wanted to, he'll have to look back at the the film and the tape and, um, you know, some of the plays that, especially like third downs um, that didn't work out or pan out for Texas. Uh, he said, you know, as you said, he said at, at the time he felt like it was the right call, but the first person that he um, 
really takes a look at and like grades is himself. And he has to w- look at the tape to see if those were the right calls in the moment, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying about Jonathan Brooks. I, I don't think, I don't think it's like a sound the alarm type of situation that he wasn't utilized more, especially knowing that the game plan was to throw the ball a lot. So um, I don't think it's something they're just waiting for said Baxter, Cedric Baxter to come in or anything like that. Um, Jonathan Brooks has been very capable. I, the, I would say the only surprise was that Keelan Robinson was kind of the lead back. Um, and that, that, that was a little surprising to me, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, he's, yeah, I mean, he, he's been a hard worker. Maybe this was kind of like a reward for his hard work because he's been, you know, one of the best special teams players that Texas has this season. He comes in off the bench as a third string running back, you know, and made plays. So I, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this is kind of a reward for him just kind of being a team guy for, at all, you know, on both offense and special teams. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, I'm not too concerned as much as, you know, about like them giving up on Jonathan Brooks or even Jaden Blue at this point. I think, I think it was just, it's a one game kind of anomaly. And if the plan was to throw it, then I think that that wasn't some like lip service we were served by by Sark in the end of the game. Well, let's give out some attaboys. Uh, Casey Kane with 100 yards receiving in this game. A lot of it in catch-up mode late in the game. Uh, but Casey Kane ends up with four catches, 108 yards. Um, had uh, a long of 49 yards, 46 yards. Uh, after completion, so he was uh, catching and, and running with the football. Um, Keelan Robinson ends up with six catches for, for 40 yards. And uh, Jordan Whittington, five catches for 44 yards. Um, and I thought, you know, a, a, another big moment in the game was, unfortunately, uh, a huge drive by Washington uh, right before the half. They end up kicking a field goal. Texas did a great job of limiting them to a field goal, but uh, and they kind of got lucky because Roma Dunze had the ball in his hands for a touchdown and and dropped it. Uh, But Ryan Watts ends up uh, in an awkward collision with uh, Washington's tight end. It looked like he hurt that right shoulder again. We know Ryan Watts has had stinger issues. He leaves the game and does not return. So the boundary cornerback position in the second half was held down at first by Austin Jordan. I mean, the entire third quarter was Austin Jordan. I was a little surprised by that. Uh, I thought Terrence Brooks would be rotating more uh, with um, Deshaun Jameson, but clearly Deshaun Jameson playing his last game as a Longhorn uh, pretty much held down that field cornerback position the entire game. Terrence Brooks finally got in in the fourth quarter, and he almost had a pick six. Um, And Jalen Ford mentioned Terrence Brooks after the game as a guy who has really come on and a guy he's excited about going into next year. And there's a very good chance that Terrence Brooks is going to be the guy to beat at that field corner position. Uh, Watts will be back at the boundary corner position. Of course, you've got all these young guns coming. I mean, you got Jalen Gilbo will be back healthy. You've got Austin Jordan, uh, Xavion Bryce, and then you bring in Malik Muhammad, uh, the five-star corner or four-star, I guess, he ultimately ended up as. But um, there's a lot of competition, and you're bringing in Gavin Holmes from Wake Forest. So you've got uh, some interesting um, storylines to watch at that cornerback position. and. Um, you know, but that did affect the game tonight. And so, uh, as we talk about Michael Penix and his, um, he got better as the game wore on. I thought the deep Texas defense got tired. You mentioned it. They got pressure on him early. He didn't like it. He threw the ball away a lot and the Texas defense played well in the first half held uh, Washington, you know, it was only what 13 to three at halftime held him to 13 points. You'll take that. Um, and then as the Texas defense got worn down and stayed on the field too long, uh, the pressure stopped getting, um, stopped being as effective and, and Penix started completing more and more 
So, uh, and, but I and did I think, think that's also, a, oh, sorry, a, a testament of what Ryan Watts has been to the secondary this season, you know, with him being out of the game. I think that definitely played a role in that too. Yeah, we saw that against Iowa State. I mean, when he went out of the game and they brought in Austin Jordan and Terrence Brooks, that was kind of the wake up call to Austin Jordan and Terrence Brooks that, hey, you got to study. You got to be ready. Uh, you can't just um, cruise and try to get by on your physical ability. You you have to study. You have to know what receivers are are doing, what you know, what the offense is trying to do to you. And and I thought uh, Terrence Brooks really came on here the second half of the season. So uh, throw a little sugar his way. And and Jalen Ford, you know, disappointed. Said after the game, I had, you know, he had a big miss tackle Taylor on yeah. third and five. He had uh, the you running back stop for about a two yard gain, and the yeah. kid broke loose. Ended up, you know, a seven yard carry to convert third and six. And Jalen Ford said, I didn't have the game I wanted. He sure sounded like he's coming back. I asked him, you know, is it fair to say you're coming back? He's like, well, I don't want to game, you know. But he he sounded like a guy who was, you know, talking about his teammates next year. And and so we'll see. But, um, you know, Jalen Ford's been so good. He was he was not happy with his performance tonight. And um, and. You know, you lose Keandre Coburn and Moro Ajomo up front. You need, um, you know, you need Byron Murphy, Vernon Broughton, Alfred Collins uh, to really step up. And Tavondre Sweat, Tavondre Sweat, who's, you know, been identified by Steve Sarkeesian as a leader, an emerging leader on this team. They need him to be a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a big, physical, strong dude. So, um, and we heard Pete Kwiatkowski mention that he thinks Sadir Mitchell, the freshman, can come in at uh six foot four and 330 pounds and and be able to contribute next you know next season as a true freshman yeah yeah and that that's always good to hear especially at this stage and and one of the attaboys i do think we need to credit is jaron thompson i think he had a pretty solid game um he played really hard you could tell he was playing really hard he was hitting really hard um he got that interception um in the first quarter so that's one I didn't want to forget him, but he I thought he had a pretty solid game. And that's another guy that's going to be back and supposed to be a leader. And he was a guy, Chip, I'll say with him earlier in the season. You know, there was questions of is is he going to be the liability? Because there were times last season when he got benched, you know, where he was the liability. And I really think he, he he's come on a lot better as, as the season has wore on. So he'll be, you know, kind of a leader guy next year, too, for Texas. Yeah, he he leads Texas with 11 tackles tonight and that interception, as you mentioned. Um, and you're right. I mean, Jaron Thompson, all of his teammates talk about him now as an unquestioned leader on this team. And uh, so he's he's a guy who deserves a lot of credit for uh, getting, um, you know, showing that growth and development. And he's a guy who with Anthony Cook moving on. And, um, you know, they suffered some attrition there at safety with J.D. Coffey uh, leaving in the portal. Obviously, you've got Derek Williams coming in, who I think is a monster. Uh, he reminds me of a little bigger, more physical version of Deshaun Elliott. I, I said on the flagship podcast last week, Michael Griffin says that Derek Williams reminds him of Derwin James, who is a pro bowler with the Los Angeles Chargers, you'll take that comparison yeah. every day. So um, you've got some young guns coming in. Anthony Hill at linebacker. He's going to be a guy who will play right next to Jalen Ford. And and I think Mo Blackwell, uh, again, tonight, Mo Blackwell uh, didn't have huge numbers. Um, in fact, he only had one tackle. Uh, but he's... He is a fast physical presence and he'll only get better as you know, he goes through this off season. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, I was going to say Anthony Hills chips early man crush, I think for <laughs> next year in that no 2023 doubt. signing class. <laughs> no doubt. And you know, you, you talk Darian Gallette, uh, Leonga LaFau, uh, Samaje Burrell. This is a loaded linebacker class and, and so let's, uh, Anthony Hill's getting here. 
next month or next week or whatever, January 9th. Um, and they can't wait. They can't wait because this kid comes in with a man's body, but he's only 17. Right. And, um, you know, they just love his his love for football with that body and that love for contact. So uh, there's there's talent coming. And and I, I think this defense will have a chance to to be as good, if not better, as long as Jalen Ford comes back. And and this offense will get better, but they have to be able to run the football. And there's no question about that. And we saw it down the stretch. Uh, they ran it down K-State's throat, down Kansas' throat, down Baylor's throat. And, and, and it made life so much simpler uh, for this Texas offense. So, Yeah, um, the defense is going to be interesting because there will be, what, six starters that will be gone from this year's team. And the, these are guys that played a lot of – snaps a lot of reps at Texas too. So um, there's definitely a lot of talent on defense returning. However, there's not a ton of starting experience when you look at the overall unit, but I still think, I I think it's going to, I don't think you're going to see a massive drop off or something like that, but there are going to be some unproven guys or younger guys that are going to have to really take that next step to be ready. Yeah. And Michael Taff is an interesting story. Obviously, he goes from walk on to scholarship. The coaches trust him. He's a big time special teams weapon, and he's a guy who got more comfortable uh, in the safety role as the season wore on. And so, you know, you've got B.J. Allen and Larry Turner Gooden as well. And Larry Turner Gooden is a guy I'm hearing uh, has really come on. And so, uh, he's a guy who's going to make his push in spring football. And you're right, you lose Anthony Cook, you lose Deshaun Jameson back there, you lose DeMarvian Overshone and, and Diamante Tucker Dorsey, you lose Keandre Coburn, Moro, uh, Ajomo. Uh, those are significant uh, you know, players on this defense this year. Moro Ajomo, the highest rated defensive player on the Texas defense, according to Pro Football Focus. So um, but you've got uh you got some you got some dudes, uh, even with experience on the roster right now, in addition to all these young guns coming in. Yeah. So um, you know where to go. You know where to go. Horns247.com. We'll keep you up to date. I told you in the insider uh, that came out last night that it looked like it was going to be a pass-heavy game plan and that Keelan Robinson could end up being the guy at running back. And sure enough, that's how it played out. Um, much to my dismay, but I'm a big Jonathan Brooks guy. So, um, Hey, Taylor, anything else here before we sign off at one in the morning? No, I was just going to say like, it is one forty in the morning. I think it's time to sign off, but, um, you know, we'll have a lot more after we have a chance to kind of rewatch the game. We'll have a lot more kind of thoughts, um, you know, next week on the flagship podcast. So as always, you want to stay tuned for that. Yes. So everybody, uh, have a have a happy new year, and there's a lot of excitement after that top three recruiting class for the Longhorns. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian and this staff really, um, you know, bringing in the talent. You got to stack classes, and they're doing it. And it didn't work out tonight, uh, but Washington, man, Michael Penix Jr. His idol is. Teddy Bridgewater, and he reminds me a lot of Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's Gamer. a great, yeah. So uh, kudos to the Huskies because they they wanted this game more than Texas mm -hmm. did, and they they played to that, and and they deserve to win. All right, we will uh, sign off from San Antonio, the Alamo City, at one forty three a.m. for <laughs> Taylor Estes. I am Chip Brown. Until next time, we'll see you over at horns247.com. Don't forget to take advantage of that 50% off um, special going on right now. Even month-to-month -month members at Horns247 right now can upgrade to annual and get all the benefits of the preeminent 24-7 sports network. You get all the VIP access to every team site. It's absolutely fantastic. So uh, take and, advantage and access of to Paramount Plus, too. That's right. And you get a year of Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. You kidding me? <laughs> I mean, come on.
treat yourself to a New Year's gift right there. New and, Year's resolution. Uh, Sign up. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be back. We'll be back this week um, or next week. Yeah. Next week. Next week. With uh, the flagship podcast. Until then, happy New Year, everybody. Stay safe and keep the faith.